Diversity recruiting is about more than finding someone different. It's not just about ethnicity, nationality, gender identification, ability, etc. It's about thought. It's about identifying, hiring, and determining how to retain talent that will change the trajectory of your college or university because they disrupt your institution forward. This episode features someone who is very near and dear to me, one of my best friends, Rory Verrett. His background and insights into diversity recruiting are solid gold in helping any organization build a compelling employer value proposition narrative. And he joins me on this edition of I Want to Work There. No matter the institution, company, or organization, everyone wants to find the best talent and everyone wants to keep their best talent. Higher education is no different. I'm Eddie Francis. I've worked in both talent acquisition and higher ed marketing. On this podcast, we're going to explore the ways to create a great experience for faculty and staff on your campus. Because in education, a great employee experience equals a great student experience. And who doesn't want that? We'll have some honest conversation, get insights from experts, and hear success stories from campuses. It's all about developing an attractive employer brand, something that'll make the people say, I want to work there. Rory Verrett is the founder of Protégé Search, an executive search firm that focuses on diversity recruiting and leadership development. He made history with the NFL as the first ever head of talent management. He has shared innovative insights on diversity and inclusion with Fortune, Forbes, and the New York Times. Rory has also testified before the U.S. Congress as a national expert on diversity and inclusion in corporate America. Through Protégé, Rory has worked with such organizations as Peloton, Ben & Jerry's, PayPal, the New York Times, the Seattle Mariners, and recently announced the Westminster Kennel Club. He's the author of the soon-to-be-released book, The Pomegranate Principle, The Best Practices on Diversity Recruiting. Rory, welcome to I Want to Work There. Happy to be here, Eddie. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, too. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Rory and I are good friends. We've known each other. Get this, dude. We've known each other for 40 years. It's a long time, bro. It's a long time. <laughs> It's, it's a, a long very time. long time. So let me tell you something, man. I was uh, recently talking to um, a business counselor, and he told me something really, really interesting about starting a business. Mm -hmm. He said that when it comes to starting a business, what determines success or failure is whether or not someone is pushing or pulling. Some folks push an idea onto the market, and that kind of puts them in a not so great path. Mm -hmm. But other folks are pulled by something that they need to do, a problem they need to solve. With you, protege is a definite pull, mm -hmm. and that's diversity recruiting. Yep. You, you're passionate about it. How did you develop that passion? What motivated you to get into diversity recruiting? So I was sort of in diversity recruiting informally before I was in it professionally and formally. What I mean by that is, and I talk about this in the Pomegranate Principle, I am, and maybe you are as well, what I call in the book, first generation big time. I'm not first generation college. I'm not first generation to organizational politics, but I'm first generation big time in that I'm in these complex organizations and I'm trying to be the CEO or I'm trying to be in leadership. I have a lot of ambition, but the skills I need, particularly the soft skills, are not as well developed as my ambition. So I need mm. to clear that gap somehow through mentoring or through leadership development or through a sponsor. And so I, I realized that early on as a lawyer, didn't have a lawyer in my immediate family, didn't know how to think about what law firms to go to, didn't know how to determine if I was a litigator or a lobbyist or a corporate transactional lawyer. So I started doing a lot of research in law school because I was ignorant. I was like, how do I figure this out? You get in law school, you have about six months, they give you a honeymoon. And then after that, they're like, litigation or corporate? Um, are you going to be a lobbyist? New York, DC, where are you working? And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a lot of that information. I need to find it. So I wound mm -hmm. up doing a lot of research, reading books, talking to lawyers, talking to my mentor, who was a, a black uh, partner at a firm. And I became a resource for my law school friends. They would say, hey, man, 
Call Rory. Like Rory knows which law firm to go to in New York. Yeah, because I've read three books about it. I'm, you should go to Davis, Polk, and Wardwell. They're better at the whole corporate transactional role than, than, than litigation. So now I'm into my career as a lawyer. And again, I'm this informal mentor. I'm this informal peer mentor to a lot of my, my colleagues. And I wind up getting on the radar of a search firm. I'm, I'm interviewing for a role in public policy at a utility company. And they're like, you know what? You'd be a great recruiter. I was like, I don't even know what you guys do. But anyway, it's actually <laughs> a policy job. They were like, no, no, no. You, you should think about executive recruiting. I'm like, I don't think that's right for me. I took a test, the Wonderlook test, the same test they give to NFL yeah. quarterbacks on their leadership skills. And I, the test results came back. And the, the, the head of the executive assessment practice was like, he looked at me and kind of pierced his eyes. I was like, I failed the test. He was like, no, we've never seen a score like this in the history of the firm. It's mm. like you knew what the answers were. I was like, I didn't cheat. He was like, no, you can't cheat this test. There's no way you could cheat it. He's like, you are the walking example of a headhunter. I'm like, I don't even know what y'all do. He was like, it, it, it doesn't matter. We can tell you, but you have the disposition of a recruiter. I was ending an entrepreneurial venture, and I said, I'm going to try this out. I met an African-American executive who was the, the head of the CEO practice. And he was like, I went to law school, then I worked at a utility company, then I did something entrepreneurial, and then I joined this firm. And he didn't have to say the ellipse part, look at me now. And I was like, I know, you're balling out. And so I looked up to this guy and I said, I'm, I'm going to join the firm and see what it's like. And I fell in love with recruiting. How I got into diversity recruiting officially is that I would interview candidates. I'd interview a white candidate, I'd interview a black candidate. They'd have the same fact pattern. This is how the white candidate interviewed. Well, I was at Goldman Sachs and I decided after becoming partner and being a partner for two years that I wanted to flex my entrepreneurial muscle. So I started Acme Investments. I've been doing that for five years, but now I'm ready to look at new opportunities and your client's opportunity seems really interesting. I'm like, oh wow, this is an impressive person. You know, it was a partner, started his own firm, amazing. So the black candidate said, same fact pattern. Well, I was at JP Morgan Chase, I was a partner for two years, survived the first wave of layoffs, then the second wave of layoffs, and then the third wave of layoffs, they really, you know, I got laid off. And so I've been looking for a job for the last few months. It's become a year now, and I'm, I'm doing some consulting here or there, but, you know, I, I'm looking for my next opportunity, and I'm, I hope you can help me. Same fact pattern. They both got laid off. Mm -hmm. They both were doing consulting. Somebody told the white executive, Start Acme Co Investments. Name it. Say you lead a firm. Go to the market and get these consultant projects under the name of the firm so that when you interview for your next job, it sounds like you are an entrepreneur and not just an independent contributor consultant running something out of your basement. They were both doing the same thing. The storyline was different. Neither one of them were lying. It's just a different version of it. So I realized that plus other elements of their careers, a lot of people of color just, they too were first generation big time, and they did not have the knowledge of how to be a candidate for an executive leadership role, how to play hard to get, how to be engaged, but not too thirsty. They would negotiate really weakly against me representing my client. And there's a lot of other stuff that they didn't know how to operate. And I said, well, th there's, a, there's a need to really bridge that gap at scale helping these candidates and these executives on how to succeed in their careers. I can't tell you how to be an investment banker, but I can help you get the investment banking job of your life by preparing you with interview tips, coaching, and other knowledge. And that's what really launched me into Protege. We were an executive coaching firm first that started doing executive search after clients reached out to us. There's a lot in what you talked about in your story. And what strikes me is the difference between the way the your, 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 your scenario about the difference between the white candidate and the black candidate mm -hmm. What's interesting in the context of higher education is that notoriously we say this in higher education all the time is that people are so used to operating in silos. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is. I'm wondering when it comes to that silo concept that we really talk about, I'm wondering and listening to you, how many people are the black candidate? They might feel isolated and they are they are thinking about their path, their path in terms of survival. Mm -hmm. 
versus the white candidate who not only I'm, I'm the difference I'm hearing is that the white candidate, first of all, had they have a community, they have mm -hmm. they have mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it seems they have this pretty strong internal locus of control that says, listen, this isn't working out. So I'm going to do something. Mm -hmm. I got to do something different. And so they operate a lot differently because they might have a they might have more supports or they mm -hmm. like I said, they may have this this internal locus of control. So what when, when, when I'm really wondering here in your experience, when it comes to diversity recruiting, do you find that people who represent who are part of a, a minority group? Mm -hmm. Do you find a lot of times what they need is that? motivation in terms of community in terms of mentoring mm -hmm. and they do need somebody to say well it's not that you've been laid off a bunch of times it's just that you've had setbacks and you need to find your way forward do, do you right. find that that happens with a lot of people in a minority set of candidates yeah i i think to put it simply it's a scarcity mentality and this mm -hmm. is also this is also part of what I think is part of the ethos of the first generation big time. You do not believe in your unconscious mind that you can take risks in your career, risks right. at your job. So you tend to play things pretty conservatively. And Every, everything I'm, everything is everything is I'm afraid to lose. Correct. Correct. Right. As a coaching candidate told me, he said uh, and I, and his executive, his CEO was telling him. You're in a comms and a marketing role right now. You have to take more risks in marketing than you did in comms. I need some creativity out of you. And he was like, and I asked him, I said, so that's the, that's the rubric they have for you. What's preventing you from being more creative? He was like, creativity is risk. I got to pitch 10 ideas, maybe two stick. He said, let me tell you something. I am the biggest deal in my family financially. I support a lot of people in Kansas. If I lose this job. People are not going to high school. People are not getting college tuitions paid. People are not getting little league fees paid. He said, the worst thing I could do is lose this job. And at this company, which is a big giant company, you don't get promoted if you take risk and you fail. You get promoted by not making errors. So I'm just trying mm. to stay alive till I become in senior management where the big money happens. But the last thing I'm doing is risking this job for anything. And so what I had to talk to the CEO about was give him permission to take a risk, give him backing. If he, if he fails, cover for him. In places like higher education, where there is also a scarcity mentality because the jobs are scarce. These are, these are good jobs with good benefits. They're generally stable. Universities don't have boom and bust cycles like tech companies or investment banks or other corporations. So they're highly coveted. So people protect their turf. They wind up mm. doing a good, good to great job in what they do, but they're not trying to collaborate across the organization naturally. There's nothing that naturally uh, encourages that. What encourages is you put your head down, you do your job, you perform high, rinse and repeat for 30 years and you retire. This is actually something we we talked about on episode two of, of the podcast with a guest named Kevin McClure, and he talked about the very same thing: uh, how higher education is so risk averse, and mm -hmm. there is it, it is a scarcity mentality. But you know, the other thing, the other part of this, and and I know this coming from the the marketing and comms, uh, uh, you know, side of the house, is that there is such a fear of one mistake ruining the reputation of the institution. Just, right. There's one mistake. So right. how does diversity recruiting, though, how can diversity recruiting kind of bust up that mentality? Yeah. Is there a way that diversity recruiting says, listen, this is a safe risk that mm -hmm. you can take. This is a mm -hmm. safe bet you can take. Mm -hmm. But but if you lose on it, you're not going to lose everything. You're going to lose a little bit. But if you win, you are going to win big. Yep. Is there a way that diversity recruiting plays a role in that? Absolutely. So I've had three clients in my career that are universities. Well, four. Dillard University, as you know, Georgia Tech, Princeton, and Harvard. They're all versions of the same thing. Dillard probably having the least resources. Harvard unquestionably having the most resources. But they're all risk averse. They're all risk averse. And so what diversity does, forget about 
diversity of ethnic background, gender, LGBTQ right. status, veteran status, disability. Forget about that. Think about you're bringing an other into the organization. Somebody that's not like the people that are there. So, for example, I did the head of diversity search at Harvard. This person was responsible for helping to diversify the student body, the faculty, and most importantly, the administration. So what, what, what did they find? What did we find in our due diligence? All the police officers at Harvard, Irish American, Irish Catholic from Boston. The cafeteria staff, Somali, all Somalian or preponderance of Somali. The administrative staff at the university, typically white women, a lot of Jewish white women who were second income leaders and executives in their families. Their husbands or partners were working somewhere in biotech, a lawyer, a doctor. This was a second income. So they could take a job making $125,000 a year, whereas a black person that was interviewing couldn't take it because they might be the breadwinner in their family and they needed to maximize their income. So what we found was that even in those pods where there was diversity, there was still a conservative approach. Are they like us? Irish Catholic cop, Somali American uh, cafeteria worker, Jewish woman uh, in administrative roles. And, and we found it was tough to break off because it worked. It worked. Mm -hmm. What winds up happening is people don't think, institutions don't think, departments don't think about the best version of themselves being on the other side of the DEI process. That when you bring in somebody who's other, they're going to challenge the status quo thinking. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. They're going to challenge, mm -hmm. why, why do we do this every year? We're yeah. doing something all the time and it's not achieving the result we want. Why don't we change it? If there had been diversity in the room in 2008 at those investment banks, 100% chance you wouldn't have had the debacle that was the um, the 08 financial crisis. Because somebody would have said, should we be doubling down on these derivatives? I don't know if this is this makes sense, right? But you have a bunch of people who are the same, who grew up the same way, went to the same schools, they think the same way. No one is going to stop that thinking. So you want people that can be positively disruptive, not breaking China and breaking glass just for the sake of being disruptive, but they're yeah. bringing innovation, problem solving that can be helpful to the university to think about a different partnership, to think about how to recruit differently, what parts of the country you can go to. We both went to St. Aug in New Orleans. There's a, um, a friend of mine who went to uh, a college in Vermont. Hey, man, how did you wind up at this Catholic university in Vermont? They came to St. Aug. Somebody had to say there's great African-American male talent at this little bitty school in New Orleans. We're going to go from Vermont to New Orleans and recruit. And they've been successful for decades doing that. OK, so diversity recruiting can bring that disruptive thinking. It can challenge the status quo. It can bring innovation. It can bring partnerships. It can bring relationships. Oh, by the way, you have regulators that are coming up with a tax regime that might be not beneficial to you, or you need to get some kind of rubric passed in the legislature that can help you with a technology transfer or some kind of commercialization you're doing with your with your hospital or with some drug treatment or something. Be helpful if you had people that knew the chairman of those committees and the chairwoman of those committees who might be black or Hispanic or not just white men. So in all those ways, diversity is additive. Mm. You know, in episode 11, we actually had a conversation with a, recruit, with a recruiter and uh, she's an organizational uh, culture uh, expert. Her name is Brittany King. And something she talked about was the difference between culture fit and culture cultivation. And mm -hmm. it sounds exactly like what you're saying. I mean, people saying, well, we're going to pick this person because they're like us, where they should have been saying or they should be saying, let's pick this person because they are going to add something to what we're doing or they're going to shake it up a little bit and force us to think differently. Absolutely. I have been the uh, the president of two startups. The first startup, I thought I was a genius recruiter. I recruited four of the people, four preppy black men just like me. They were in a <laughs> fraternity. They were married or engaged. They'd gone to an HPCU or PWI. I knew what success looked like. Okay, That firm did okay. Didn't do that well, but did okay. Why? Groupthink. Not that black men are not smart. These were brilliant people. They've all been, in, they've all since had successful careers. This company I founded was me and three women for the first four years. Now it's half women, 
half men, Asian American, Hispanic, black. We are from all walks of life. We have people that don't want to work on our projects with Planned Parenthood as a conscientious subjector, as a Christian evangelical. There are others that may or may not be atheists. We're all in this melting pot together. We make much better decisions because no stone is unturned. There is no intellectual sacred cow. We, we make the best decisions for our clients because we look at it from so many different angles of age, race, gender, nationality. And it's, it, it's wonderful, but I, I, I surely thought I'd solve for that being the president of a diversity themed firm with five black men in leadership. Yeah, lesson learned. Hey guys, it's Zach here, founder of Enrollify with some huge, huge news. So I am ecstatic to announce that Element 451, the AI powered all-in-one CRM platform for higher education has acquired Enrollify. Back in 2019, I approached Tony Frega, the CEO of DD Agency with an idea. Tony's a good friend of mine and so I said, dude, let's build a next generation media hub for higher ed marketers and admissions professionals. As a lover of media, I was just so impressed by how the attention landscape was changing and how brands like The Skim and The Hustle and Morning Brew began to eat up market share from more traditional publications. And I thought there was an opportunity to build something similar, uh, you know, obviously a lot smaller, but similar in the niche, but oh so important arena of higher education marketing. Tony and the leadership at DD were gracious enough to allow me the time and the space to ideate on this half-baked idea and then launch Enrollify's first ever content asset, which was, you guessed it, the Enrollify podcast. Since then, Enrollify has grown into one of the most trusted resources for candid higher education marketing content in the industry, and we've welcomed industry giants like Terry Flannery, Jamie Hunt, Allison Tercio, Eddie Francis, Day Kibbles, and Jeremy Tears, just to name a few, into our network of creators. As we started thinking about the next chapter of Enrollify's life, it became clear that it was time for Enrollify to scale. I'm pretty good at building things, but scaling things is a skill I'm still working on. When thinking about who could take Enrollify to the next level, I felt as if artists, Mallory, and the leadership at Element 451 were uniquely qualified to inherit the brand. Element has actually been a part of Enrollify's story since the very beginning. They were our second podcast sponsor ever. They have invested in almost every experiment that we've ever run. They ship product faster than any other ed tech company I've ever met. And perhaps most importantly, artists and the leadership team invest seriously in thought leadership and education. Building Enrollify has been the most rewarding experience of my professional career to date, and I couldn't be happier to collaborate with the Element team as we seek to take Enrollify to the next level. And don't worry, I'm not going anywhere just yet. You are not through with my lovely voice just yet. Um, but if you found any value in Enrollify over your years of tuning into our content or watching our videos, it would mean a lot if you could share a kind word or two about how Enrollify has helped inspire you or helped teach you something new about marketing on social media. It would really, really, really mean a lot to, to the whole Enrollify and Element team, but to me personally as well. So if you've gotten any value of any of the content that we've ever produced, share a quick story or, or a quick thought about us on social. That would be wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being here, guys, and get ready. We've got so much in store that I can't wait to share with you all soon. But for now, back to the podcast. You're listening to I Want to Work There. I'm Eddie Francis, and we're talking to Rory Verrett. He's the founder of Protege Search, and also he's the author of the book, The Pomegranate Principle, The Best Practices in Diversity Recruiting. And so why did you decide to write it, this, this great work of yours? No book like this exists. I mean, that's, that's rare you can say that. No book like this exists. There are books about diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy that have chapters on recruiting, but there's not a full book devoted to diversity recruiting in the executive ranks. And it's because there are not many of us doing this work. I mean, there are probably 10 people in America that are doing diversity recruiting at the executive level in, in a sustainable, successful way. There are people that are doing diversity staffing. They may be doing... You know, they may be shopping resumes around to companies, but to do it in the boardroom, in the C-suite for organizations that like we do it, it's maybe 10 recruiters. So it's just it's just a very niche industry. And our mission is to help companies do this better. So you'll love this. I mean, I, I look at this as I don't think about our company's peers as our role models. I think of restaurants as our role models. And my restaurant is Dookie Chase. I want Protege Search to be the Dookie Chase of recruiting. 
it's all about the impact and longevity. It's not about the wealth and revenue. Dookie mm. Chase doesn't have 15 locations. Well, if you have 15 locations, the business operations of that enterprise become, I want to make sure all 15 locations do the same thing the same way. When you go to Morton Steakhouse, they're trying to make sure that steak in Miami tastes the same way you had it in Las Vegas as it does in New York. Dookie Chase is like, you're going to come here. You're going to have a spectacular experience. It's a certain kind of food that you are intentional about getting. And it's a place that gathers elite leaders and regular folks. So I, I look at our firm as, as doing that. And, and the pomegranate principle is really a way of helping people with the recipe book from the restaurant that you can do this yourself. If you apply it, all the principles in our book, you will likely lessen your need for a firm like ours and you lessen the need for external recruiters. Now, why would I write a book like that? Because our mission is to improve these professional outcomes so that we equalize the playing field for leaders of color to really live their best professional lives inside companies and nonprofits. It's really interesting that you use Dookie's. Um, and, and so for the for the listener, Dookie Chase is a legendary Creole restaurant in New Orleans. I actually grew up only blocks from uh, Dookie Chase. And now I want some chicken. Um, so <laughs> exactly, man. So um, so so let's I always like to ask my guests about the way forward for colleges yep. and universities uh, to become great workplaces places of choice to work places that when someone says they when someone takes a look at it the employer brand is so great it's a pull and they definitely want to work there so i'm going to ask you a two-part question here sure. um so university comes to you they say we need a vp of i want to get an idea of what your questions are and then the second uh the second part of the question is in the context of being a great place to work, what do colleges and universities really need to consider for their executive recruiting practices? So the first part is somebody comes to you, we need a VP of. What, what kinds of questions are you asking them right off the bat? First, I ask questions that are contextual for the fact that no matter what the enterprise is, university, company, nonprofit, tech startup, the talent still has the leverage right now. It is we're still in a war for talent. So it's not it's it's tell me about this person's career once they get here. Who's their mentor? Who are their peers? What's the career trajectory for this person over the next three, five, seven years? What does success look like for the enterprise and for this executive if we recruit them? Because that's the second part of it is that's what I have to talk to this candidate about is I got to create a narrative that is one part, the wonder and majesty of this incredible institution. Second part, what it means for their career to come here. And third part, this is why this organization and this role at this moment is right for your career based on my understanding of the trajectory of your career. So it's so most companies, most organizations, most universities think, just we're Stanford. Tell them we're Stanford. Yeah. Tell them we're Harvard. <laughs> exactly. that's, that's right. But the person interviewing at Stanford is also looking at Harvard and Caltech and USC and UC Santa Barbara, which is on the ocean. You might see Oprah at lunch. Yeah. Right? All these organizations have value and prestige and cachet. And so whatever you're wherever you're recruiting, you've got competition. You're never you're, you're never alone. I used to tell um the senior leadership at the NFL when I was the head of talent, I, you know, because the NFL thought it was the NFL. Who wouldn't want to work? Here? I was like, OK, you know what? We are like Tom Brady. You know what the talent is? Giselle Bunchen. <laughs> Tom has <laughs> options. Giselle Bunchen has options. OK, so you, you're in a competitive landscape. What you have to do is create a narrative. You have to create a narrative. You got to figure out what are your assets that the candidate market is going to look at and say, wow, that's really interesting. I did not know that they had this as part of the value proposition. For some, for some of our clients, it is we lead with the benefits. I had a client that offered, that offered every candidate, every executive that worked there, from an assistant to the CEO, $72,000 a year in child care credits uh, uh, benefits that can be used for tuition. 
So that mm-hmm. can be used for private school tuition, college tuition, $72,000 a year. I've never heard of that. We led with that. Oh, by the way, it's a pre-IPO company. It's doing AI technology. It's very cutting edge. It's going to go public in a couple of years. It also has this benefit. So it's a narrative. What are your assets? Is it a great location? Is it great benefits? Is it incredible research that's important and impactful to, to the community you're recruiting from? Is it low turnover? Is it a warm and hospitable culture as evidenced by your employee engage, employee engagement surveys? Uh, does Glassdoor tell this same story? I mean, there's all these assets that we, to use the analogy again, we put in a gumbo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we're like, these are the ingredients. And then we serve that up to the candidate market. For the NFL, for the time I was there, we led with, it's the NFL. It's a privilege to work here. That was That was what we said. What we found out is that's what the NFL would say to players to sort of get their minds right when they were focused on, you know, being as good off the field as they were on the field. I said, that doesn't work with employees because the the folks that are interviewing here, they're also interviewing at Google, Goldman Sachs. Um, They're interviewing at Apple. They're interviewing at Airbnb. They're interviewing at the NBA. We're all premium elite organizations and they have their pick. So what we did, particularly for women, was we changed the narrative. We said, you know what we have? We've got a base compensation, bonus compensation, a long-term in lieu of stock, so you get three layers of compensation. We got a 401k, a pension, a pension match. We have great maternity benefits. We've got an adoption benefit. And by the way, it's kind of a nine to six job. It's phone company hours with Goldman Sachs money. So once we started with quality of life, as the narrative, as opposed to, oh, my God, Michael Vick's in the lobby. Can you imagine? Like, guys geeked out about that. I mean, I opened the door. James Brown is in one door. Mike Shanahan's in another conference room. Yeah, guys geeked out about that. But a middle-aged woman executive was like, I may or may not care about that. What I do care about is, as one candidate told me, can I, can I be a parent to my two autistic children while yeah. being an executive here? So you got to figure out at that university – what are your narrative assets as perceived by the candidate market, not by you, by mm. what the candidates are going to lean into, and tell that story? But bef- before we get to the second part of this, though, I-, I have got to ask you this because I think a lot of, and it's not just colleges and universities, but this does happen a lot in higher ed, where people, like you, you alluded to this, there are certain institutions that don't think they're going to get turned down. And so have you ever seen a situation and I'm sure I know I know the answer to this, but have you ever seen a situation where great candidate a that the institution or the organization is saying, oh, yeah, once we get them, we're going to be golden. And candidate a says, no, I'm going to go to this other place. And then when you go back to the client, the client's like they did what they choose. They chose who over us. They chose them over us. Have you ever seen that happen? All the time, all the time, all the time. And when I talk to uh, clients about it, I'll ask them, I'm like, you know, I might say, you know, what kind of car do you drive? A Volvo. You don't drive a Mercedes? No, I don't drive a Mercedes. Why not? Well, it's too expensive for what you get. Hmm. So the cost versus the value is out of whack. All right. Mm-hmm. I said, maybe, maybe this candidate thinks that about this organization that they've heard it's very political. You have perhaps a five day in the office requirement versus a hybrid or full remote scenario. It's a longer track to be promoted in this organization. Your glass door reviews are kind of mixed. So we, 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 try to, we, we, we try to be honest with our clients. Look, there's somebody for everybody. There's somebody for every organization. Sometimes the client has to understand where their candidate mix is. OK, the, the, the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, they are fishing in different ponds than the phone company or Rayovac or the utility company. It's a different candidate pool. OK, it's a different candidate pool. So the, the, the key is to get great candidates that will make spectacular impact in your organization and stay longer than normal. That's that's the that's the goal. It's not just getting a great candidate. It's getting somebody who will stay and then make an impact and then and then and then be in the organization 
you know, to mentor others, to lead departments. So it's all about having that reality check. Mm. And the second part, you know, what do colleges and universities need to consider about executive recruiting? I mean, you put a lot of thoughts on the mm -hmm. table that are considerations. Is there anything else that you can think of or anything you would add to what you've already yeah. said? I, I, I would just say there's a misnomer out there just in general about recruiting that a recruiting firm has the database of candidates about <laughs> a particular role. Like, oh, we, we know marketing. Like we do a lot of heads of HR, chief diversity officers. We recruit broadly in sports and entertainment, COOs, heads of marketing, you know, broadly across the organization. And I would tell clients when I pitch them, I'm like, we don't have some secret cache of candidates that nobody else has. LinkedIn has 900 million profiles. Everybody <laughs> has access to everybody now. Like when I was at Spencer Stewart, it was like, okay, well, we got 5 million, 5 million people in the database and Corn Ferry has 4 million. And it was an arms race. Then LinkedIn was like, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to democratize this. We're going to make yeah. this available to anybody with a computer and a, and, a, and a credit card. And so we have access to 900 million people. So it's not about your access to the candidates. It's your ability to cultivate a relationship candidate by candidate. The best candidates are not working. Not saying there aren't great candidates who are not in W-2 jobs. There, there clearly mm. are. But the majority of the candidates are doing great work somewhere else. They're not on LinkedIn or on Indeed looking for a job. They're doing great work. You have to disrupt that person's Career. I call. I tell our team. I'm like, when you're sourcing for talent, you are disrupting somebody's day. You're disrupting their month. You're disrupting their lives. That has to be done in a very delicate, sophisticated manner. There's a lot of nuance with that. Okay. Hey, Eddie. Hey, Eddie. Want a new job, bro? Eddie, you want a job? Like, no. What? <laughs> you never called me back. But if 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 I have a paper trail about myself or the firm that signals that we have similar values, okay, and I call you and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about this opportunity. Just give me 15 minutes. Okay. I'm trying to get you to consider it because at the end of the, at the end of our conversation or series of conversations, it may lead to you packing your house up and moving somewhere else. I can't get you yeah. to think about that in 15 minutes. I can get you to think about, are you interested in this kind of opportunity in your career? Yeah. Well, I think I have an opportunity like that that might fit. By the way, by the time I talk to you, I've done a whole deep analysis of your background. I know where kind of the holes are in your resume. I know what you seem to be wanting to do in your career. And then I've got my client and I do the pitch. So I would, I would tell university leaders who are in talent acquisition, who are in HR, is find a firm that can help create a narrative, that can cultivate talent and do it in a way that is a, alongside your values as a firm. If you are very warm and fuzzy and collaborative and then your, your your recruiting firm should be like that they should be an extension of you if you are data driven and you want a very specific metrics based process that your firm should be like that so pick an organization a firm that is reflective of how you want to deliver your message in the candidate market because you know what it is eddie it's marketing <laughs> recruiting <laughs> that it is a marketing with a hook on the end of it <laughs> <laughs> And that's why we do this podcast. Uh, Rory Verrett is the founder of Protege Search, an executive uh, search firm. He's also the author of the book, The Pomegranate Principle, The Best Practices in Diversity Recruiting. We have that information in the show notes. Rory, how can folks get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you do? Uh, I hang on LinkedIn like an old man at the nightclub. So <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Uh, I actually had an uncle who was 67 who was profiled on the news. He was you know, dancing disco John. Anyway, I am on LinkedIn <laughs> all the time. Uh, Rory Verrett, there's not a second one. And just connect with me, send me a LinkedIn request. I love to connect with you and, you know, discuss your career goals or uh, have you in our database for future opportunities with our clients. All right. Rory Verrett, the second best speaker on the St. Augustine High School speech debate hey, team, by the way. <laughs> there you go again. Speaking truth. <laughs> I, Rory and I, we have this thing going back. You know, Rory, let me just tell you how he intruded on my household. He told my son that he was the best one on a St. Augustine High School speech and debate oh. team. And by the way, so we're gonna take, we're taking this to the grave, man. We're taking listen, this man, one to the grave. I, I, I did I, I did even worse with Fred. I said, Fred and I, after a couple of drinks, we were watching the Soul Rebels in DC. Now Fred invited me. What are you doing right now? I was like, 
nothing. He's like, I got tickets to the Soul Rebels. I was like, okay, I'm going. So I literally just went, met with him and Carita, Carita Fletcher, not Carita Ducre mm-hmm. was there. We all hung out. And after a couple of drinks, and I got the nerve to say it because he was driving me home. I said, Fred, I am the most storied trophy winner in speech bit history. <laughs> Fred looked like somebody slapped his mother at Easter, right? He's like, <laughs> Are you, blind? Are you out of your mind? Then he says to our, about our dear deceased speech coach, like before Mr. Augustine settled into dementia, he wanted to settle, settle that first. He told me the Tombar twins, the Tombar brothers were the best he'd ever seen. I said, is that what he said before he settled into dementia? That that was his last <laughs> lucid thought, Fred? Like, I'm just saying. I was like, I, I don't think he said that, Fred. I think you're lying. I think you're lying. <laughs> Rory, thank you so much for joining me on I Want to Work There. I Want to Work There is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, check out other Enrollify shows. The Enrollify Podcast Network is growing by the month with all kinds of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows. And they're jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. There are some great industry voices that you can check out, like Terry Flannery, my good friend Jamie Hunt, Allison Tercio, Corinne Myers, Dustin Ramsdell, Jamie Gleason, and many more. Learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. So uh, come and find yours.